Hello, welcome to our channel, where we set out to explore wonderful great works of literature while dressed in elegant clothing because... Why the hell not? So today let's do something a little bit more on the mystical side. And with that, we actually have uh, Der Golem in German, which in my pronunciation is horrible, but in English it's the Golem. And did you want to present? Do you want oh to yes, give, look uh, at this delightful this beautiful, uh, beautiful edition. Uh, this is uh, actually from Germany. There's um, a publishing house called uh, Black Letter Press. And uh, you can see it's a beautiful um, rendition. It's like very petite and cute. Yes but also magical at the same time. Yes. And we have a, uh, copy number 37. So there's, mm -hmm. these are like a, a limited edition out of 250 copies. So if you actually also have this, just let us know what, uh, number, you are what number you have. <laughs> That's right. So with um, Gustav, My um, uh, Gustav Meyring, uh, his actual real um, name was Gustav Meyer. Um, so this was kind of like, the Meyring was kind of like a pseudonym that he kind of took on himself. Um, he's actually considered one of the best uh, German uh, supernatural writers of all time. Probably like up up in the same realm as um, E.T.A. Hoffman. Yeah. And we really enjoy his, the works. His of books were banned during the Nazi regime. Yeah, not E.T.A. Hoffman's, but Gustav Meyrings. Yeah. yeah, and um, yeah, I think he was like very much like uh, critical of um, sort of the positions they were taking in their militarization and all these different things. But he was also fundamentally known for his interest in the occult mm -hmm. and various forms of mysticism. And he kind of like, he translated the Egyptian Book of Thoth and he, he read widely and translated a lot of works as well. But eventually he ended up converting to Mahayana Buddhism. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah, nice. so he ended up becoming a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. um, at the age of 24, we should note, um, so of course he was born in Vienna. Um, and uh, I think uh, he, he ended up becoming a banker, mm. which is very interesting. And I think there was some fraudulent activity associated with his banking schemes and whatnot. There's a bit of a controversy there. Uh, but at the age of 24, he was going to actually commit suicide. He, was, oh, yeah. he had the gun in his hand and he was actually going to shoot himself. But someone actually had slipped in a note, apparently, under the door right before he was going to do it. And and then, his son, right? No, 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 oh, no. This was a completely different story. Oh. So, And he ended up picking up that note and I think it was some sort of pamphlet and that kind of brought him around to the spiritual realization that there was something deeper, deeper meaning mm. to life and that this was a message for him not to kill himself and to pursue some other, other path. Yeah, but there's still tragedy in his life. Well, yeah, so he had a daughter and he had a son and the son had a skiing accident um, and quite young and um, he broke his spine and I think he was like, you know, chair ridden whether wheelchair or he was stuck yeah. on a sofa or something but ironically his son ended up committing suicide at the age of 24 which is exactly the same uh he same was age he was going to do so it's creepy yeah. yeah and then so so he died actually later that year the father gustav meyring died after his Six son months is, later. something along those lines after his uh son's suicide so anyway yeah. very very tragic slightly morbid um but yeah, it's not going to get any uh, any uh, lighter from here. I wouldn't say it's a morbid book, though. I think there's some morbid elements okay, in it. Okay, there's more. Yeah, there's some morbid elements. It's kind of like the dark underbelly. So essentially, this whole uh, plot is situated in Prague um, and in the Jewish ghetto. Prim yeah. Primarily, it's in the Jewish ghetto, and it's, it's, and it's heavily laden with Judea mystical Judaism symbology. Yeah, like a lot of Kabbalah and. Um, Sort of, yeah, a lot of esoteric, a lot of esoteric concepts, a lot of uh, symbolisms, um, and of course the central, or I, I would say central, but also peripheral theme is this idea of the golem. Mm -hmm. And if you go back to Jewish lore, not the Lord of the Rings, golem. not the yeah. <laughs> although probably it was he, uh, Tolkien Based was probably maybe influenced, this guy? Maybe, yeah. probably was influenced by that older tradition yeah. of the golem. But the ancient Jewish notion of the golem was, I think from like, you know, the, the Middle Ages, uh, was that um, one of the rabbis, by breathing in sort of the divine words upon a piece of clay molded in the shape of a human being, kind of like a little homunculus, that he was able to animate it with life, and that it was be able to have a life onto its own. And the idea of the golem was, in essence, to protect 
the Jewish quarter mm -hmm. to ch uh, to protect the sort of the um, the Jewish ghetto uh, from from outside influence, but also at the same time it was supposed to be um, a carrier of all the sins and all the anxieties and all the fears of the community members into that one into that one embodied creature to dissipate it essentially almost like a scapegoat in a way mm -hmm. you know that all of the unconscious elements the dark unconscious elements that would tear our community apart its role was to kind of like absorb that energy mm -hmm. so it's it has so he plays a lot with some uh, with these uh, sort of notions and he mixes them all in um, did you want to talk a little bit more about your impressions of the writing style or the book? Yeah, the, the writing style was fascinating because it's, um, at times you felt like the time had slowed down and it was dragging on, dragging on the amount of detail that was sometimes put in, in length, like a great detail made you feel like the book was slowing down mm -hmm. and that at other times the detail was so... And the, the scenes moved so quickly that it felt like time sped up. And I think that was honestly intentional based on yeah. the intention of the author to depict that sometimes time is not um, linear, that it's... It's, it's, it's malleable in a way. Malleable, yeah. Um, so that aspect of it um, was very interesting. I don't, think, I don't think I've had read too many novels that plays with the time to that degree. And also just the, the disjointedness of yeah. it. Like at times it was very, the, the storyline was very clear. And then other, other times it would it's, become dreamlike. Yes, and that's exactly what I wanted to get to as well. Mm -hmm. I was like, there's a phantasmagoria aspect of this book where you do feel like you're being kind of like lulled into a dream, right? Mm -hmm. And sh ideas and scenes are shifting into place and other things are transforming into other, other elements. And you don't quite know where you are. And I find like you 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 say this in terms of the experience, and this is my experience as well. It's like it's hard to read out loud to somebody. Like let alone reading it for yourself. This was hard to kind of like read to a partner because yeah. you really have to follow with the images uh, very closely and attentively. And it really takes a strong level of concentration to be able to uh, sort of keep that up, keep the momentum of that yeah. for any prolonged and, period of time. And like I mean, regardless of how knowledgeable you are on symbology, it's just like there's there's almost every sentence has like at least three references to Other, mystical yeah. symbology. So it's like it, you could reread this probably like thousands of times and see something new. In fact, it is something like I think I, that's in, encouraged to. Yeah. I think people encourage you to read it. Yeah. In times. fact, like I think as you sit with it afterwards. And reflect on it so much comes up that you almost want to reread it again be like what did i oh yeah that was referenced this in here that now this seems to make more sense but i can't really directly remember exactly what they were referencing like for example with the hermaphrodite there was some really like important one line discussions like or the key the whole it. thing was yeah. the hermaphrodite as well and yeah yeah, yeah. well you know carl jung uh, the famous psychoanalyst was also very intrigued by this book and he actually referenced it in many of his uh, collected works, um, you know, uh, to kind of show, in a sense, like the unconscious nature of the human psyche, mm -hmm. that there are darker elements within us that, you know, almost have an autonomous nature, and they come about sort of when we least expect it or we least wanted to, and it's like this inter mm -hmm. intermediary space between dream and wakefulness. Yeah. So, what are some of the other symbols that you remember them speaking to? Well, I just remember the there was like so the main character's name is Pernath. And sort of, uh, he gets uh, a lot of these weird hallucinatory visions, and he gets a book one day from this creature that you've realized is the golem. And essentially, what he does is he he kind of repairs. He has a gemstone cutter, so yeah. he repairs a lot of sort of like ornate works and clockwork and sort of like you know gem pieces. He's a bit of an artist, I guess. And um, you know, when he opens up his book. He gets this almost like we were talking about the imaginal realm, this idea of uh, a realm that is an intermediate between, you know, the the world that we inhabit and sort of the fantastic, right? That's imagination is the, the bridge between 
what we consider real and the real, real mm -hmm. capital R, right? Like a trance like dream. Yeah. And like these entities, these women are dancing in front of him as he's reading these pages in this open book. And it just becomes like this this vision he sees, right? Mm -hmm. And it kind of like unfolds and he starts to blend into this golem and the golem blends into him. And throughout the book, there's like three female figures. Mm -hmm. um, one is Rosina. She's like... Um, a young sort of licentious almost like a, a gypsy like sort of figure who dances half naked in the bars and kind of like She's this a prostitute too. Yeah, yeah well i guess that helps yeah, yeah. <laughs> to describe it <laughs> so like there's this like sort of almost like animalistic sort of feminine energy there right that brutal sort of destructive element of it mm -hmm. and then there's the other one which was the alluring I Eros think she, sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you i think she also represents the daughter because there's all these Kind of male protective figures in Rosina's life, so I feel like beyond just the central component, she also represents the do like the daughter like figure. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, like I don't remember the uh, the the one of the most like uh, I don't remember the Angelina. other Angelina. Angelina, who was kind of like the sort of the seductress, very sophisticated woman. She's like a very a beautiful. Yeah. I wouldn't say alluring. she was. I wouldn't say she was sedu a seductress. I think she was very alluring to women or to women to men. Um, because she was vis visibly like very beautiful. But then she did, she was kind of seductive too. They were kissing in the carriage. Do you remember that? And she's yeah, like, oh, take true. me now. And like all these. But not to the degree that Rosina was. No, Rosina's like, it was primal, Rosina. And, and then there was the third woman. Who's like the main woman. I don't know why I'm forgetting her name. Yeah, the one. Go on about her. I'll yeah. Her name. And she's kind of like, she was like the innocent, sort of like virtuous young girl, young woman. Who believed in sort of in miracles and had a high religiosity and a high spirituality and sort of like very lofty in a way i've just found right and he was really kind of attracted to her miriam. the most miriam yeah yeah miriam. Well, and i feel like miriam represented like almost like this mother mother this archetypal mary, mo figure. mother mary yeah type of figure yeah where she was like she's not judgmental of anyone like there's mm -hmm. no even the worst, like, crook in the ghetto who literally would kill kill or uh, blind and maim people for profit. Um, she still had this, could see even within his nature. The goodness. Yeah, and the, the possession that can take over someone to create, to commit these crimes. Not an excuse to their behavior, like, she didn't excuse it, but she said she would always, even despite, even despite the, like, horrific crimes they committed she would still see them as human and she could understand yeah right yeah on some yeah. level yeah. yeah without condoning yeah yeah so it's like these the plays of the archetype of the feminine as well so mm -hmm. that kind of like summarized that aspect of it yeah and uh um, and like the symbology of it the reason why i think Miriam was also like almost like a mother mary figure was that he'd be the jeweler would be main character where Pranath, Pranath yeah. would be like literally creating um, a gem stone carving for Angelina and his intention was to draw or imprint or carve an image of Angelina but then all the images would always come back to Miriam so it's like almost like she represented the good in all in all women that like nurturing figure in all women whether he saw it at that moment or not he, he would appreciate her loving side despite any, um, despite his, like, lust for this other woman, she mm -hmm. kept coming back to him, even in his unconscious or yeah. subconscious. Yeah. yeah, no, it's all very interesting. And uh, Pernath is also, like, I guess in the Jewish quarter, they're also plagued by this sort of, like, rummage dealer named Wassertrum. Yeah. And there's, like, some sort of, like, everyone's fearful of him, except another sort of uh, old Jewish man named Hillal, and they, they kind of like, it's almost like a good versus Miriam's evil thing, Hillel. Miriam's father, yeah. And so anyway, so there was this one interesting, and well, many interesting uh, scenes, but one in particular where he actually ends up descending under the ground mm -hmm. through some sort of doorway, and he ends up going to this dark tunnel, the main character, Pernath, and he's kind of like fumbling his way through, and then he finally like opens up the doorway on the other side and he ends up in a room that has been rumored by the local townspeople to be uh, a legendary room that has no entrance and no exit. 
and anyone who's ever attempted to enter from the outside have died like at their peril because there's only one window yeah from the outside yeah. way up in the top, top of the tower of, yeah and there's a bar across it so no one can get in yeah and they just end up falling to their death despite having like ropes or whatever they attempt they make so another thing we should mention just because you just mentioned the tower is the tarot and like yeah. a lot of the symbols of the tarot cards are actually found scattered throughout this yeah. this book and the significations and i have a book on the tarot cards and we're just kind of reading it on the side, trying to make sense of some of the imagery. Mm -hmm. But the tarot, yeah, the tower is definitely one of the the, the main images. Yeah, the main images there. I think it was I think it was either the hanging man or no, it wasn't the hang, hang, hanging man, but there was the death card. No, it was the hanging man the hanging as well. Man, that, no, the one I know that was also referenced, but there was yeah. at one point the golem. So Perneth ends up is essentially the golem. They're the same, one of the same. Um, Spoiler alert. Sorry. Well, Not I mean... All. It's fine. Anyway, so he would... When he would have... He found these tarot cards that were as cold as ice. Oh, yeah. And then one... I think the image was either... I thought it was death, not the hanging man for some reason. Or was it hanging I man? I thought there was the hanging anyway, man. Anyway, there was one of the two, two Because his leg cards. was crossed. He's upside down um, and his leg okay. is crossed. Well, one of the two would morph him into the tower. Like, that's... All of a sudden, he would kind of become... The card would become him, and he would become the card, and it would kind of yeah. turn it from his like dark side to his. So he would turn into the golem, or he would turn into Purna. Well, he'd, on he'd see the card's image, and he'd see recognize the face as himself, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 But there was also, I mean, the hanging man came up a number of times, including literally when they were Purna was in prison, and then this man came. I think Laponder. I can't. Not sure if I'm pronouncing the name properly came and he he was very interesting because he came in and um Pernath was being convicted wrongly of murder and this Laponder comes in and he's this like they describe him as being this like small almost angelic like face of an Asian gentleman slight figure very feminine delicate looking yeah and eventually Pernath gets the courage to ask him what he committed like what he was in there for and Laponder says rape and murder, and and Pernath is so disgusted and revolted that he can't even look at him. He's just like, this is just really confusing. How can someone so delicate commit something so awful? And then he just kept thinking of all the women who were in his life and how he would just never, like, he, he couldn't even imagine what that would look like. It was too revolting for him. And do you want to continue on? No, that? no, carry on. No, carry on. And then, so they're sharing a cell, and he's like, this is just unbearable. Like, it's unbearable to be here day in, day out, but now I have to share it with this, like, person who committed an awful crime. And and he admitted, like, LaPonder admitted that he um, accepted the crime, the punishment to the crime. He, he admitted to it, yeah. Yeah, he's like, he, so he will be hung, um, which, again, is the reference to the hanging man, right? And then... So LaPonder falls asleep at night, and all of a sudden, Pernath hears him talking, and he's like, what? And he listens closely, and he's like, I could have sworn like this, this the voice of M Miriam. And he, like, at this point, he has realized full-fledged that he's in love with Miriam, um, and that she, he just thinks that she's the most remarkable woman that he's ever met, and he can't get her out of her mind. And then all of a sudden, she's speaking through this LaPonder while he's asleep. And so he ends up having like a full conversation with, with both Miriam, Miriam's father, Hillel, and I think even maybe his friend too, right? And so then he realizes, oh, this man was probably, didn't actually commit the crime. He's like, obviously has some sort of gift or like is possessed by other people's spirits. Other entities. And other entities, like there's something else going on. And then they have this conversation when LaPonder's awake about what happened. And LaPonder just admits that, yes, he realizes it wasn't him who actually committed it, but his body did. And so he's like, I can't lie. I cannot say that I didn't do it when my body did do it. And then there's this, like, conversation about from Perna. Perna's trying to convince him, well, you know, you're, you're probably, like, you can be say that you're criminally insane and they, they that might not lead to your death and he's like but I'm not criminally insane like 
this isn't about necessarily insanity. This is, I'm fully aware of what happened. I just couldn't control it. It was some other being inside of me kind of scenario. And so it was very interesting because on one hand, he was in the body of someone who committed the most atrocious crime. And yet he was so accepting of death to the point where he wouldn't even lie about it. He's like, well, I could do this again. Like, who knows? My body could become possessed again. This could happen again. So for the common good of all people, actually, I shouldn't be alive. <laughs> um, despite his like nature, his like genuine nature to be the most compassionate and loving human, which just kind of reminded me of, um, of Jekyll and Hyde kind of situation where there's this like dark and very, very dark and very, very light side. And yet, and like the extreme virtue of I will literally die for a crime that I really didn't commit for the sake of the rest of the world being safer. Um, yeah, so that, that aspect was really... And so then when we looked up the tarot card for Hanging Man, we read it in a bit more detail. You probably remember that component a little bit better. Where it's like, one of the well, things is the Hanging Man... it's a Man, suspension, it's, Yeah, right? it's, yeah so and, Well, it's just like it's a, a suspension in the sense that sort of the, the Hanging Man... His feet are aimed in the heavens because that's where he's grounded. That's his true home. That's his origin. That's where he comes from. His true nature is in the, in the heavens. And the head, the part that we think and we use thoughts and kind of like contemplate and try to like analyze our logical parts of our brain, it's the head. It's the part that is associated with the ground. Mm -hmm. It's the, the part that's associated with the sort of the lower aspects. And so it's kind of like, the, this is also goes back to Plato as well, where the, the idea is that like human beings are inverted images, mm -hmm. that we are literally upside down because uh, we are essentially like um, plants where our roots are actually, we're inverted trees in a way. Mm -hmm. Like our roots are in the heavens and our flowering and mm -hmm. final blossoming is down here below. Our manifestation is down here below, but our roots are actually above right, right. and so it, yeah so so I think like the yeah. point of what I was saying to that is that La Ponder really did embody this hanging man because even though he wasn't the the typical human in the sense that um, you know usually we're conscious of the things we do to some degree um, he detached in a way he, that but he was he was in between he was in this in-between mm. state so when he was he would say, I don't dream, I wander, I wander. So he was literally in this, what I think, I imagine this imaginal realm. Yeah, suspended almost between Yeah, suspended between, and you're not really sure, like, so when, when uh, Pernath was speaking to Miriam's voice through La Ponder, you, you don't know whether this is reality, or, is, mm. or are they speaking in a dream together? And she said at one point, I'm, I'm asleep, I'm alive, I'm not dead, I'm asleep. And so they're speaking through a dream and he's describing like, she's describing, oh yeah, when he wakes up, um, La Ponda remembers everything that he saw um, through the eyes of Miriam or whoever he was speaking to. And so he described them being in this building and that the building was on fire, mm. right? And so anyway, we were, you're like, is this just a dream that the building's on fire? Is this reality? Are they in a place where the, fire, the building is on fire? And then later on, at the end of the book, there's a character that is, um, an looks... Old character. An old man, right? An old man, but looks just like Perneth, who, in one, <laughs> in one flicker of time, knows everything about what Perneth experienced. I'm not going to go into too, too much detail about that. Yeah, it's complicated. But essentially, he sees what Pernath saw in that dream of seeing um, the f building on fire. So he goes and he asks, he goes to the actual building where Miriam was supposedly in and asks historically, was this building ever on fire? And they're like, no, 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 it was never on fire. So then you wonder, like, how much of this is, like, how much did Miriam even really exist? Was this just part of this imaginal mystical realm was or what did she really exist but part of her also existed in this dream state like 
did Pernith really exist? Was he, or was he just the golem? Like, you, you don't just, really it, ever know. It, it actually, like, inserts more questions yeah. than Yeah, so you're like, now I need to, yeah. that's what we're, I'm saying, that like, you need to, like, almost reread it. Mm -hmm. But I found the hanging man aspect interesting because it's, again, it's, he's, he's only able to communicate with other people when they're maybe perhaps in a dream state or in the match. Like maybe he's not actually speaking with real humans. Maybe he's speaking with mm -hmm. um, this imaginal realm, right? And so that, when we read the Hanging Man card and the tarot, the description of it was the embodiment of really what is human, which is um, this, this in-between this in between of, of reality, a constant in-between of reality and the imaginal. Yeah. Um, and I just thought that was kind of him perfectly because he's, and also it, it depicted that you can be both good and evil, kind of within the same. That's human nature. We're never truly a hundred percent virtuous or truly a hundred percent evil. We're always both. And I thought thought it was just such a perfect imagery of the hanging man suspending between the two reality. Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. That's actually very true. And then there's also like the Jungian aspect where he was just saying like. These psychic entities have autonomous natures. Mm. Despite what you or I may want to have happen, sometimes you fly into a rage. Mm. Or you feel overwhelmingly sad for like no apparent reason. And yeah, so like what, how many times have we heard the same story? Like it just came over me. Yeah, yeah. Something came over me, right? Or, you know, you know, well, how, the language covers it in you know a considerable detail, but it's just like, you know overwhelmed, you know, flooded with tears. Like, the, all of these different things actually, like, intimate that, you know, emotions happen to us, thoughts happen to us, ideas happen to us. It isn't us that produce them. We are simply almost like the, the filters by which they manifest into the world. Mm -hmm. And so that's a deeply esoteric notion of human psychology. But even to this day... Like, there is no definitive answer whether you want to take a, a materialist perspective or a mystical perspective. You know, it's, in a way, they're both conjoined. Yeah, and I think a component of it, too, is also playing... Like, there's lots of characters who are playing with this idea of, like, trying to control our human human feelings and notions. Like, Hillel trying... Not Hillel. Um, Wassertrop trying to... Wassertrim? Was, yeah. Wassertrim, sorry. He was in love with his wife, deeply, or not, maybe they were never married, were they? I can't remember. Anyway, with his, this woman, and then they have a son together, and then he, like, rather than, he was, like, so afraid of love, of his own emotion, of mm. what that loss could mean, that to control that, he sent her away and became, like, really cruel. Like, not just sent her away, like, sent her away to cruelty because he was so afraid of losing her, and yet... By trying to control that situation, by controlling he, the loss, he the loss, he ended up losing her. Like not even that, but also the respect of his son. Like he lost way more than yeah, yeah. So yeah. anyway, th anyway, there's a lot of there's so much you can talk about, and there's so much more we missed. I'm sure. Of course. If there's any like other symbolism, we'd love to hear if you've read it. Yeah. You know what their takes were on it because. I'd love to reread it and see what you're, what you saw through it. Too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I played a lot with the Kabbalah and the, the Book of Yibor, and I'm sure many other things that other religions do that we probably do. Yeah, other, I'm sure there's a lot. Like of the tarot is in there too. So yeah, that's really interesting. Really. So you want to read it? Okay, I'll do you first. Okay. <gasps> uh, I'd rate it a solid uh, four out of five. I think because yeah. there's like, you can mine a lot of gold in there, a lot of gems. Yeah, it's kind of like a thing of its own. It's, it's hard to even It's a singularity it's onto itself. Yeah, I would give it a four too. Yeah. It's, it's not like, an easy read. No. It's not a, an enjoyable read. You don't just sit there and like, oh, I'm going to just like sit here for an hour, two hours and just like immerse yeah. myself into this wonderful fantasy land. It's not quite a book like that. I'd actually... It feels I'd like a dream. I'd actually take your time with it. Yeah. Because it's... Like, there's a sentence that sometimes I had to mull over for quite a yeah, while. It's, it's heavy, heavy, yeah. heavy going stuff. Yeah. Anyway, well, thank you for joining us. And uh, we hope to be back uh, fairly Certainly. shortly with another uh, gothic esque mm -hmm. uh, writer. Uh, yeah, Shirley Jackson. Shirley Jackson. So if anyone's a Shirley Jackson fan, we've been ruining out the storm of all her 
short stories. And it she's great. Yeah, it's great, and I think it kind of ties in a little bit to this some similar themes in the Golem. Oh yeah, you picked those up for sure. Mm-hmm. Okay, well anyway, thank you for joining us, and you have yourselves a wonderful evening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you again for Take joining. Care. Bye. Bye bye.